A report's calling for new steps to prevent abusive treatment of LGBTQ youth in juvenile justice settings. The report was done by the Fenway Institute and the Center for Prisoner Health and Human Rights. To tell us about the concerns addressed and some possible remedies is the director of the Health Policy Research at the Fenway Institute, Sean Cahill. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Sean. Thank you, Chris. Sean, I want to start with, with how much of the population in the juvenile justice system is LGBTQ uh, what are we talking about here? Yeah, so it's estimated that nationwide about 20% of the youth in the juvenile justice system identify as LGBT, and that's more than twice the rate we see in the general youth population. Generally, we see maybe 7 or 8% of youth identifying as LGBT uh, in the general population, but in the juvenile justice involved population, it's more like 20%. If that figure is true, why do you think it's as high as that? Well, there's an emerging body of research um, as to why LGBT youth are overrepresented. Um, it's believed that some of it has to do with family rejection. Uh, LGBT youth are often rejected by their families. They may become homeless. They may engage in shoplifting or other um, you know, activities that get them caught up with, um, with the juvenile system. Um, there's also research that shows that um, sometimes gender variance is seen as being rebellious. So young people, particularly girls who are, um, you know, butch, who are, who are not stereotypically feminine, um, may be treated differently than other girls in schools, and that can cause them to get involved with the juvenile justice system. So we're still trying to figure it out, but there's definitely an issue, and there's definitely an overrepresentation. I, I, I can imagine a, a lot of this population being bullied in the neighborhood, bullied in school, right. and then you're, you're in the criminal justice system, aren't they going to be bullied again, maybe? Yeah, that's another factor that really we need more research to understand it, but we know from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which Massachusetts and other states do, and most of those states now ask about sexual orientation, and nine of them ask about transgender status for youth. Um, we know that LGBT youth are more likely to be bullied and victimized at school. They f um, are more likely to report feeling unsafe at school, uh, and they're more likely to bring a weapon to school um, in, in a few instances. You know, that's not a common behavior, but... And so all of those, sometimes fighting back if you're being bullied, could get you caught up with disciplinary action and if it escalates uh, connected to the juvenile system. What about the way things are now in Massachusetts? I mean, I, I, I find it hard to believe we have the worst system in the country, but how, what is it like? We actually have a, a very good juvenile system. Our adult correction system has a lot of room for improvement. But if you look at our juvenile justice system, it's actually quite good when it comes to LGBT youth. And we have some very good, what we consider to be model practices and procedures at DYS, at the Department of Youth Services, which is our juvenile system. So we've actually highlighted them in this report. Um, we also highlight best practices from Houston, Texas, from Denver, Colorado. Um, but Massachusetts really has some great policies and procedures. Those include training all staff and volunteers who work in the uh, Department of Youth Services so that they can understand the experiences of LGBT youth, how they might be different from those of the majority of youth, uh, and just sort of how to uh, work with youth in a respectful, non-discriminatory way. Well, uh, there were cases when staff can be uh, the abuser too. That's right. And, and, and regardless of a sexual orientation or identity, anything different has to be done with the population you're concerned well, about? Well, one thing that the research tells us, actually the Bureau of Justice Statistics has done research that shows that uh, lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth are more likely to be sexually abused while in custody than heterosexual youth. They're, about, they're almost twice as likely in general to be abused. Um, the rate of abuse by adult staff against youth is about seven, seven and a half percent for all youth. And there's not really a difference between uh, LGB youth and heterosexual youth. But we do see in that data that sexual minority youth or lesbian, gay, bisexual youth are about seven times as likely to be abused by another youth. Um, so there's much more abuse youth on youth directed at gay, lesbian, and bisexual youth than there is at heterosexual youth. So that's a real problem. And we have a law in this country called the Prison Rape Elimination Act, which was passed in 2003, and the regulations have been implemented over the last few years. And that law requires juvenile systems and adult corrections facilities to screen um, incoming uh, uh, youth and adults to screen them and make sure if they're LGBT to sort of keep an eye on them and make sure they're not being victimized because of these higher rates of sexual victimization as well as just physical assault and physical violence. Um, one thing about 
juvenile systems and adult correction systems is that they can be hyper-masculine environments where there's a lot of homophobia and a lot of prejudice against people. And like the worst thing you can be is to be accused of being gay or bisexual. Um, so it's really important that adults working in juvenile systems keep an eye on gay and lesbian and bisexual youth and make sure they're not being victimized. This has been the news. We're talking with Sean Cahill from the Fenway Institute. Sean, when you're in that kind of a, an institutional setting, you have uh, concerns about whether there should be separations for, let's say, using the showers or mm -hmm. for searches right. or otherwise. What about your recommendations around that? So the best practice for showers is that transgender youth, uh, gender nonconforming youth, and also intersex youth um, be allowed to shower separately um, uh, in, and basically individually. So they shouldn't have to shower with the rest of the um, juvenile population. Um, and that can provide privacy to them, but also um, reduce victimization. Um, one of the things that we've seen in adult prisons is sometimes prison staff will act in a voyeuristic way with a transgender or intersex prisoner uh, and like do strip searches just to like show the genitalia of that individual, which is really problematic and very traumatic for that prisoner. So in, in youth settings and in adult settings, that's a best practice to allow them to um, shower individually. Uh, and then the Prison Rape Elimination Act um, prohibits cross-sex um, searches of prisoners. So a transgender female prisoner should not be searched by a male uh, staff person. Um, ideally, that person would be searched by a female staff person. So the best practice we recommend is, is that in a juvenile setting where most of the staff may be male, um, that the, ju the juvenile be able to choose the sex of the person who, um, who searches them, in, in mo you know, except in extenuating circumstances. Well, you, you know, e even the worst people who end up uh, being incarcerated have trauma issues. Oh, yeah. Uh, what about uh, the trauma issues for this population? How yeah. are they being dealt with? Um, well, we're, another part of the training that we really want to see is training healthcare providers who provide healthcare to justice-involved youth in the particular experiences of LGBT youth and the particular health um, needs of LGBT people. Um, so that could include HIV and STI screening. Um, it could include uh, hepatitis C screening because hepatitis C is often associated with injection drug use. That's another you know, uh, behavior that can get you caught up with law enforcement and, and get you incarcerated. Um, and then um, there's definitely other kinds of victimization that people experience, like I mentioned earlier, physical and uh, bullying, um, sexual victimization, and sort of just making sure that young people are getting the treatment they need for that is really critical. Um, LGBT people may be more likely to experience depression, social anxiety, in, the, in general, the general LGBT population. Um, they're, they're, we see higher rates of substance use in the LGBT community. So it's really important, particularly when people are on the verge of being released back into society, um, that there be um, services provided to ensure that they can reintegrate and not recidivate, not end up back in the system not violate their parole, but actually be able to stay out and integrate back into society. We should mention you've got more details in the report and there's a way people can find it. Yeah, um, our website is fenwayinstitute.org. Fenway, like Fenway Park, and Institute. Uh, and if you uh, go there, you can find the report. You can also search Fenway Juvenile Justice. If you Google that, you should probably find the report. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Chris. Sean Cahill from the Fenway Institute. We'll have more news in just a moment.